Thank you. Is this on, Scott? It's done. All right. It's a humbling thing to worship God, isn't it? It's a humbling thing to come before Him and just, just to praise Him. And you realize all this journey we've been going through to this feast, when God decided to bring His people out of Egypt, He began by revealing Himself in the flame, in the fire, in the bush that was burning but was not consumed. And it's that God who is desiring to come into our lives to burn in us, not to consume us, but to give us life. He is the eternal flame. He's the eternal hope that we have. The whole reason that we exist, that we breathe on this earth is because of God. And God did not send His Son, Jesus Christ, just so we could be conscious for eternity. He came to send His Son that we would have eternal life. And that eternal life is not just about being alive. It is about having fellowship with God, knowing God and knowing His Son, Jesus Christ. It is a knowing of Him and knowing what He is doing and what He is working out. And we celebrate that, this feast with that in mind. Turn with me to the book of Exodus. Let's look at chapter 13 here. As we begin this message today, Exodus chapter 13. Exodus chapter 13 and verse 6. Instruction had already been given that they were to keep the Passover, that they were to not have leaven in their quarters. When they left, they were to make unleavened bread. But here God is giving instruction again regarding this feast of unleavened bread. And I want you to notice the emphasis that he puts on it. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. And on the seventh day there shall be a feast to the Lord. Unleavened bread shall be eaten seven days. And no leavened bread shall be seen among you, nor shall leaven be seen among you in all your quarters. So as you look at these verses, 6 and 7, what does he want you to focus on for these seven days? What is the focus? Unleavened bread. Eating unleavened bread. Consuming something. Eating of something. Putting something into you. Right? He says, seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. And on the seventh day there shall be a feast. Unleavened bread shall be eaten seven days. Almost as if, I'm, I'm trying to make this clear to you. I'm going to repeat it twice. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. Unleavened bread shall be eaten seven days. The emphasis, the point of saying it one way, saying it a different way, saying the same thing, but making the point you're getting it. Seven days, this is what I want you to do. This is your focus. And no leaven shall be seen. There's a mindset that God is creating as he brings a people out of slavery, a focus he wants them to have and a focus he wants us to have. As we celebrate this feast, how do we keep it in spirit and in truth? Turn with me over to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Notice the instructions that the Apostle Paul gives in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7. He says, purge out the old leaven in verse 7. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7. Purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. You are unleavened. He made you unleavened. By His Passover. Why we celebrate this feast is because of what He did in giving His life as a ransom for many, His redemptive power to cleanse us to reconcile us, to wash us with his blood. So now we can celebrate. He's saying, "Woo! yes, celebrate the feast. Go out, and I want you to eat unleavened bread. Wah, 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 right? What's up? What are we doing with this unleavened bread? I mean, I mean that wasn't the first thing on my mind, right? I, you read through the story, you're like, okay, I get it, we're free we go forward, unleavened bread. But the thing is, everything about what you eat, what you take in, has to change. 
There's a commitment that you make when you, in faith, apply the blood of Jesus Christ that's going to change everything about your life. The struggle that Christianity has today is that somehow the message of Passover and the death and resurrection have come without the plan for the person that God sent his son to die for, that everything would be different for them. If everything is not different in a way of godliness, we miss the whole point of the feast, the whole commitment that we made and should be continually making. When we go through these feasts, we're being renewed in the covenants and the commitments and the gospel message that comes to us that we were to be changed. Beginning with what we eat, what we consume, what sustains us. Because he said, I don't want you to eat that leavened bread. That's not what you're going to have. You're going to have something unleavened. I'm going to shock you. It's going to be different. Something that you're not used to. Because let's face it, we're not used to it. When we grow up in this world and we grow up in the ways of the world with the desires of the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, that is what is normal to us. And that is insanity. It's insanity. It is the choosing of something that can give you some quick pleasure without regard to the future. It's insanity because you fail to think about what you're doing, about what you're eating, about what you're saying, about the way you're acting. To make this happen in life, you've got to think. How many of you have been celebrating the Days of Unleavened Bread in past years? Let's say 10 years or more. All right, good, good portion of you. How many of you, in your determination to not eat any leaven, have in any of the years that you've been saying, you know what, I'm not gonna eat any leaven, only unleavened for the seven days. How many of you have ever found yourself eating leaven, physical leaven during that time? I think everybody who just raised their hand before, okay? Isn't that interesting? Why is that? You sneak it in everything, Chauncey says. <laughs> but it's true. It's like, where did that come from? You're so used to it. I'm so used to it. It's the normal way that we behave. It's the normal way that we act. It's the normal thing that we eat. What a perfect thing that God chose to show us. This is what you're so used to doing. This is something you have to get unused to doing. And how do you do it? Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. Unleavened bread you shall eat seven days. A different mindset, a different focus that we need to be learning this lesson, how powerful this lesson is. This lesson is a lesson of life that will change you in so many ways if you want it to. Because what God is revealing is how to live by faith in your life. How to live by faith, by the things that you put your attention on, by the things that you think about, where you put your focus in life. God cleansed us from unrighteousness to put us on a new path of righteousness with a different focus and a different way of living. And so what does the Apostle Paul say? Therefore, let us keep the feast, verse 8, not with the old leaven, nor of the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. In other words, we normally think in ways that are malicious or we do things naturally that are wicked. Now sometimes we have a hard time judging that. Scott was talking about this the other day. A lot of us would say, hey, I've been trying to live good life my whole life. I've been making choices to live a good life. The thing is, when you really start to look at yourself in the light of Jesus Christ, and you say, how do I compare to him? Not to anybody else in this world, but to Jesus Christ and the perfection that's in him, how do I measure up? See, that's a hard comparison to make for us, isn't it? Because you think of the times that you were only thinking of yourself and you weren't thinking of somebody else. The number of opportunities you missed to serve when they came up. The number of times that 
you were just kind of crabby and said something you wish you wouldn't have said. The time you blew up and you just let it go. The time that you had an outburst because you were just so frustrated and upset, it, you finally blew. All the things that you can think of in your life, the ways that we have just blown our time and just wasted so much precious time that God has given us. And just so many things that we can look at in our lives and say, I'm not Jesus. Therein lies the comparison. Therein lies who we're to be looking to. Now, as much as we can look at Jesus and have a conviction of sin, we are to be looking at Jesus with the conviction of righteousness. To have his spirit in us, teaching us, there's where you're going. Put your eyes on him. Put your focus on him. That is where I'm taking you. This is the journey you're on. Till we all come to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Everything we do as a body is encouraging one another to keep looking at him, to keep focusing on him in faith, believing the transformation that takes place in our lives by faith in him. See, if we start looking at ourselves and how we fall short and we try to fix it in our flesh, we're going to keep falling short. But these days of unleavened bread are saying, you need to eat something different. You're eating things that continue to produce the wrong things. I want you to think about how much time God spends talking about food. Right? What you should eat. Herbs that I make. I put you in a garden. You can eat whatever fruit you want except that one fruit. Right? Of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I put all these animals here before you. I want you to eat these. Don't eat these. Love and bread. I want you to eat this bread, not that bread. The sacrifices you bring forward. Don't eat any of this, but I want you to enjoy this one. In this offering, you should eat. It's a lot of food, a lot of consumption. And a lot of times what God does is make a comparison between something he wants you to have and something he doesn't want you to have. Because there needs to be a discernment of the difference between holy and unholy, between clean and unclean, and that comes from God. You know, when you look at these words in regard to Malice and wickedness. We kind of look at the. Ah, it's locked, there we go. I'm clicking. I'm clicking. I need help. There we go. We have the malice, the wickedness, the evil thoughts, the evil words and deeds, and then the unleavened bread, the sincerity, the truth. When you put those words together and you look at where God is taking us, he's saying, this is where you are now. I know that, but we're not going to keep the feast with that. We're going to put our mindset on the new. The celebration is of the new, of sincerity, the purity of thought. That word kind of means uh, like a test. They would, they, would take a, they would take jars and pitchers and things that they would make They'd hold up to light to see if there were cracks in the workmanship. And if the sun revealed a crack, then they knew they, they had a vessel that wasn't, wasn't good, but a vessel that could withstand the sunlight test was a vessel that could be used. And they would test the purity of that so they would know what they were dealing with. And so when it came to these words, are you looking at Christ the purity, the standard of purity. This is one of the hardest things we face because at the very beginning of our redemption and call, we have faith in Jesus Christ, but do we have faith in the work that he is going to perform in our lives after he delivers us and shows us the truth? You know, the Israelites went out. They marched through the sea. They saw their enemy crushed. But the reality is, was God going to take care of them in the wilderness? That was where they really started to be tested. What was in their hearts and minds? Because outside now, there was no power of the enemy. And friends, if you've accepted Jesus Christ, there's no power that can hold you against his power. The only way we ever go back is by submitting to that lesser power, by continuing doing the same things we've always done without having faith in him to recognize the changes we need to make. 
And the story in the wilderness did not go well. In 1 Corinthians 10, the Apostle Paul wrote, that's all written for us, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Admonition for us, that though they drank of that spiritual drink, and they ate of that spiritual food, and the rock that followed them was Christ, and though they were baptized in Moses in the sea, with them God was not pleased. He wasn't pleased because they didn't live by faith. They didn't walk in the ways that he had asked them to walk. There has to be a belief in you that this can happen. If you don't believe that Jesus can transform your mind, transform your heart, you probably already lost the battle. Because until you have faith to believe in his work, you've already given in to what's less. You can't give in to what's less. The fight is, I'm going to follow him in a new way of life. Are you with me? Are you in? Do you trust him? There was a tightrope walker back, I believe it was in the 1800s. He was a Frenchman. And uh, the great Gaudin, I think it was his name, he, uh, don't quote me on that, but he was a person who grew up around circus and tightrope walking, and he was the first person to ever have a cable strung across Niagara Falls. And across Niagara Falls, he was going to walk. And people said, oh, this is so crazy. What are you doing? Putting a cable out, he's going to walk across, you know, with the wind and the breeze and just the water rushing and all the, the forces that go on, just the, the, the wind that, that's on there, and here he's going to walk across. Well, they make it out. He walks all the way across, one side to the other, across Niagara Falls. Starts coming back, does a cartwheel. Does a backflip. And then finishes, and he walks to the other side. And everybody cheers. They're so amazed. Like, what is up with this guy that, that did this walk? So... After a little bit of time, he came back to Niagara Falls again, set it up again. This time he takes with him props, different things. And he would take and do different maneuvers on the, the wires. People would watch and just be amazed at the awesome power of Niagara Falls and this man walking above it. And one of the things he used to like to bring with him when he would do uh, the walk across was a wheelbarrow. He would, you know, put the wheel of the wheelbarrow on the, 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 the wire, the cable, and he would, he would walk it across, which is really amazing when you think about it. I mean, wheelbarrows are not easy to, to, I mean, maybe, you know, maybe that's just me, but I mean, it's just, you know, they wobble a lot. They move around. It's hard to keep them on a straight line. So he did this, and man, he did some amazing things with the wheelbarrow, made it across, made it back. Everybody's just roaring and cheering. Because this guy's just amazing. It's like whatever he wants to do, it's amazing. And so he says, hey, do you guys all believe that I can walk across Niagara Falls on this wire? Everybody cheered. Yes! Woo! We believe. And he said, do you believe that I could take this wheelbarrow and go all the way across to the other side without it falling or me falling? Yes, we believe. Woo! And he says, well, if you believe, who would like to get in? And not a single person stepped forward. Finally, his manager, after there was just silence and shock at the question, said he would do it. And so he didn't take him in the wheelbarrow. He waited till the next time. But what he did was he put the manager on his back, a man who was about his weight and size, and he walked him all the way across on the wire and all the way back. That guy was all in. That guy was a believer who was willing to put his life in the hands of another he believed in. You have to be all in with God. You have to trust that when Jesus 
has the wheelbarrow on the wire of life, and he says, I want to walk you through this. You have to be willing to get in. You have to be willing to say, yes, Jesus, I will let you. So much that we face in our lives is the fact that we have a fear of what Jesus would ask us to do. A fear of what Jesus would put before us to give to him. Whether in sacrifice or in blessings or in hope. We have so much in our lives that we want to reserve to ourselves as if we keep carving out these portions like, Jesus, you can have my life, but not this part. I surrender all except that. And it shows up in all these ways. I surrender to Jesus, but I can't find time to read the Bible. I surrender to Jesus, but I can't find time to pray. How surrendered are you really? Because if you're not eating of him and drinking in of him, then aren't you really just kind of spiritually starving yourself? This is the bread of life that came down from heaven. This is the manna that gives life, Jesus Christ. You say, well, I read, I study, but where's the application? Do you see an application in your life? Is there an application that's focused? Are you asking for God to bless you, but you're doing things that go against His commandments? How would that work? Dear God, I'm about to rob a bank. Please bless me. (laughs) Does that work? Does that work? Could you expect God to bless you when you break his commandments? Look at 1 John, what it says. We receive what we ask for because we do those things that are pleasing in his sight. We keep his commandments and do those things pleasing in his sight. Is it a focus in your life to honor and obey Jesus? Because the surrender that we have is not just for him and asking him to come live in us, but when he shows us how to live, that we do. The days of unleavened bread talk about this regeneration of life. Turn with me over to the book of uh, Titus, chapter 2. Notice this in Titus, chapter 2. Titus chapter 2, verse 11, it says, The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Praise God. Right? Therein lies our hope. The grace of God. Now notice what it does. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us. Did you know grace was teaching you? Have you ever thought about that? That the grace of God is teaching you something. Do you look at his grace as teaching you, of having an influence on you, of directing you? The grace of God has appeared to, uh, that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. Is that what his grace is teaching you? Because that's his word to us. Is that what grace is teaching you? That this is where we go. This is our response to His grace. It's what teaches us, as God has poured out favor on us, that we would look to Him. Notice this. In looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave Himself for us, that He might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for Himself His own special people, zealous for good works. Is that your heart? Is that what you've been called out to do? Are you zealous for good works? So many people want to fight works and doing good things and being honorable. The grace of God, the one that's led by faith, not by flesh, but by faith, you will be desirous of good works. You'll be zealous for them. Give me opportunity, dear Lord. Open pathways today. Present opportunities that I can serve someone else. That is the heart and mindset of one who's been taught by grace. Because the pursuit is not of the things of the world. The pursuit is of the things of God. This has to be a walk in our lives. When we get up in the morning and we come before God and we praise Him and we thank Him, are we asking, God, 
Who can I help today? Who do you want me to serve? How do you want me to do it? Give me the spirit. Give me the heart. Give me the spiritual gifts that I need that for whatever opportunity you have, that God, you would just bless me with boldness to minister on your behalf to someone else today. That has to be a daily mindset. That we are here because we have been taught a new way of life. That we have put out the leaven of ungodliness, worldly lusts, and every lawless deeds. And what we're putting on is that unleavened. To live soberly, righteously, and godly. To look for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Got one more. This thing's killing me. And to be zealous for good works. When we read that phrase, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, we think as we well should about His return to this earth. But I want you to ask yourself, are you doing that on a daily basis? That as you go to work, or you have contact with people, or you go through, are you looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, in your day and with someone else. All of you have been called to be a royal priesthood chosen by God. All of you have a purpose that God wants to continue to work out in your life. Are you looking to be the vessel that He can use day by day? In every way, the way that you are with your children, do you look for the blessed hope of Jesus Christ to show up in the lives of your kids? Do you look for Him in your marriage? Are you looking for Him to show up when you go to work? Are you saying, God, where are the opportunities today? Because that's where the real battles take place and the real opportunities come for us to share the good news of Jesus Christ with someone else that they would see Him. And that their lives would be changed. You see, this hope and this message is for us. But it's not just for us. Having received, don't you want to share? See, that's where the gospel is teaching us. This has got to go out. More and more, what little ways can we continue to progress God's work in every way? God, show us the way. Show us a people the way that we would look for your blessed hope and your glorious appearing in our daily lives. Turn with me now to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3 is a chapter that's devoted to things to put out, to put off, Things to put in and to put on. This is an awesome chapter. Now we're going to refer to it, but I just want to go through the things that we read about here. Starting in verse 1, it says, If you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Now, I want you to notice that. It says, seek things that are above. Who should be doing that? Those who were raised with Christ. When were you raised with Christ? Romans chapter 6, right? When were you raised with Christ? It says, if we were buried with him in baptism, so we were raised with him in newness of life. Right? Right? So if you've been baptized and given your life to God and you've been raised up, this is to you and me. So what is our focus? Seek those things which are above. That has to be the prime mission. Jesus said, seek you first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness and all things will be added unto you. This has to be the focus of our lives. And then notice in verse 2, set your mind on things above. Right? So seek those things which are above and set your mind on those things which are above. We have to eat of the unleaven of sincerity and truth to change us. But then he says, notice here, verse 5, Therefore put to death your members which are on the earth. 
He's basically saying, I want you to get rid of this leaven. What is it? Can you advance that once, please? Fornication. Sexual immorality. Sexual relations outside of marriage. He said you've got to put these off. Next. Uncleanness. Basically means anything morally unclean or impure. These are things that if you were saying, how do you get rid of the leaven? Here's how. God's very specifically telling you, here's leaven in people's lives. This is what you have to push out. This is what you have to put to death. This is what you have to get rid of. It can't have any place in your life. The next, passion. An affection for things that are worldly or ungodly. Basically, you're not living like the world does anymore in their desires. Next, evil desire. That is a strong desire for things that are forbidden. Are there things of this world, of the flesh, of sin, that you really want? So you got, these are things that have to die. They have to be put off. They have to be cleansed out. Next. Covetousness, which is idolatry. Covetousness, basically being greedy, a desire to always have more and wanting it for yourself, not others. You think of the commandment. Commandment number 10, right? Don't covet your neighbor's wife, your neighbor's property, your neighbor's things. You're always wanting something that's not yours. You're desiring it for yourself rather than what would be the spirit of God? Being happy that someone else has it. See, there, therein lies the truth. That's sincerity and truth. The evil desire, the leaven, what we're natural with, they got something I want. I wish I had that. The godly spirit is, I'm so glad they have that. What a blessing that is in their lives. Look at what God has blessed them with and be happy for someone else. Next, anger. Violent emotion when upset or agitated can describe anger in delivering punishment to others. And How about the next one? There's also wrath. Fierce anger, hot, passionate outbursts. He's going to blow. Right? You've been there, maybe. I know I've been there. But just the giving out, the frustration, the things that come. You know, sometimes in life what happens is we feel that somebody is doing something wrong against us. What the flesh does is justifies that we can respond in kind. So what do we do? We get mad, we get angry. Parents, you ever blown up at one of your kids? Chances are, I am the biggest sinner of all. You know, but here's the thing. You look at your life and you say, why did that happen? Why did I get so angry? Why did I have that outburst? I was just, usually for me, it was because I was keeping a record of little things they've been doing, doing. They did that again, did that again, did that again. When are you going to stop? Right? And you get all of the frustration. He's got to blow. You know? And you get to the point of frustration. Guys, I think that God puts these little people in our houses so we can learn some lessons like this. <laughs> because I'm telling you, it's amazing. You see things in yourself you never saw when it was just you and your spouse, right? It's like, where did that come from? So these things come out because you're forced to deal with things in a different way. Somehow because of your authority, you think you have the right to have an outburst of wrath. You have a right to explode in anger when maybe you should just be more patient, more objective. Maybe you should step back from what you're feeling and be objective about the fact that that person in your house is God's child. You're just a caretaker for a little bit of time. Always easy to say up here, harder to do at home. But these are the things that we need to put out. This is the leaven that we're used to living with that we need to get rid of. Next, please. Malice. Evil thoughts, desires to hurt others. Same word that's there in the leaven of malice and wickedness. Same word there, malice. And also blasphemy. Very similar in terms of how you use your mouth. Slander. When you use your words to hurt others or discredit them. That's leaven. That comes very naturally to people, does it not? To want to talk bad about people. It's almost like in this country, we have a license to talk bad about anybody all the time. You turn on the television, it's, it's, it's gossip, it's slander. You look in magazines, you look in news reports. It's just, 
what can we dredge up on people? And any little morsel, that's not right. And of course it happens in churches, in the workplace, and this is leaven, that we might be used to consuming, you gotta put it out. It's not to be part of your life. Filthy language, foul speaking, low and obscene speech. It's just not part of the Spirit of God. This isn't the way God operates. None of these things are. Next, lying. Deliberately speaking falsehoods in untrue things. It's leaven that's in our lives. It's got to go out. Next, the old man and his deeds. Whatever is not building up toward the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Essentially, everything that is old, everything that is of flesh, everything that's of self, and self-interest and self-desire. Okay? So when we talk about putting out the leaven, maybe some of you went and, and, and de-leavened physically in your home this year, and, and you just were like scouring that place. You were getting rid of the, the bread and the cookies and the crumbs, and you were vacuuming up, and maybe you were going into your toaster, or you were doing whatever you did. There's a lesson in that about the way you need to attack this. This is where you need to spend your time. If you spent two or three weeks getting physical leaven out of your house and you're spending one hour working on this, we're out of proportion, guys. We're way out of proportion. Okay? Don't overdo the physical lesson to the point that you're missing the spiritual lesson. Because I, if you say, David, what should I do? Here you go. Here you go. I'd much rather you be focused on this because I know that as a person before God and as a church of believers together, if we can knock this out so it's not found in our property where we're dwelling, that's going to be pretty awesome. No more slander, no more blasphemy, no more foul language, right? Being forgiving, no more anger. But notice then, what are we going to eat? What are we going to eat? Next slide. And the next, tender mercies. I put literally bowels. It's, 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 a, it's a strange word, but when you understand what he's saying, the, the bowels, the most deep part of your body, that mercy and compassion would flow from the very depth of your being. That that's where it comes from. This is what you have to put on. God is saying, therefore, holy and beloved. Notice this in Colossians 3 and verse 12. Therefore, as the elect of God, which you are, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies. This is what we're taking in of. Next, kindness. The goodness, kindness, having moral integrity in the way that you act, the way that you speak and treat others. Next, humility. Lowliness of mind, modesty, and a humble opinion of oneself. You know, a lot of times the things that cause sin, specifically like anger, wrath, or maybe even sexual immorality or fornication, it's because you're living with too high of an estimation of yourself. Your ego is too high. But when you're humble that approach is different. You're, you're a lot less likely to have an outburst of wrath when you're in a spirit of humility, aren't you? As a, opposed to a spirit of arrogance or a desire that someone else would serve you. Isn't it often when we leave that spirit of service that we run into the things that are more of leaven and the things that are of God when we're walking with him? Next, meekness. That gentle, mild spirit, free of rudeness and arrogance. And isn't that beautiful? What, what God is saying, this is what I want. This is what's on leaven. This is the way I want my people to be. Next, long-suffering, patient endurance, perseverance. And you think about, again, the way that you treat one another, the way that we treat each other. Is it with this patience? Is it with that long-suffering? Next, Bearing with one another. That is, when people are going through hardships and, and things in life, are you holding them up? You know, it's kind of like when Moses' arms were tired, remember? And, they, they were gonna, and when the arms went down, they were losing the battle, and the arms went up. He needed people to come bear with him, to hold his arms up for victory. How many times do we need to do that? 
And we have people in this congregation that are suffering from ailments right now. How can you bear with them? You can pray with them when you see them. You can ask about what they're doing. You can continue in prayer when you're at home. When nobody's around watching, you can bear with them. Hold their hands up. Hold their requests up. Hold their needs up before God. Bearing with one another. Next. Forgiving one another as Christ forgave you. Now, don't you like that? He didn't just say forgive one another. He said forgive one another as Christ forgave you. How complete and perfect do you want the forgiveness of Christ to be in your life? Well then, that, whatever that is, needs to be applied to someone else. And remember, he says, as you forgive others, so I forgive you. If you forgive not others, right, neither do I forgive you. He says, the Father in heaven does not forgive those who do not forgive. That's a really important one. Next, put on love, the bond of perfection. That word is the word agape, the true outflowing care and concern. Instead of thinking about yourself, you're thinking, how can I serve someone else? Next. Next. Peace of God rule your hearts. Tranquility, a restful, quiet spirit exempt from war and feuding. Have you allowed the peace of God to rule your heart? See, that's, a, that, that's, a, that's a high thing. Again, looking at Christ, the peace of God, do you allow peace to rule in your heart? In the way that you think and approach life, is He the one that's ruling? Next. Be thankful, mindful of favors, grateful, filled with gratitude. Do you see the whole spirit that's here? What, what he's laying out for us? This beautiful way to eat, the way to live. Next, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Next, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. That we use our words and our singing to express praise for God. Next, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord with delight, joy, loving kindness, and pleasure. Next, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Now, I wanted to take the time to go through all these things because sometimes you say, well, it seems very abstract how you do this. How do you put out the leaven? How do you put on in the new unleavened bread. What are you really doing? What are you really saying? When you look at Colossians 3, it is giving you an indication of how this whole process works. It's because of what Jesus did that this should be the way our life is described. And anything short of this, we must say, I've got to go back. I've got to go back to Jesus. I've got to go back and say, God, you're the one that called me and made me unleavened. It was your righteousness imputed to me. Help me live in this new way. Now the question I want you to really ask through this feast is, are you truly seeking the things that are above where Christ is seated, sitting at the right hand of God in heaven with these things? And have you set your mind on things above? This is a recharge this is, we've got to look at this again. We've got to focus on this. When you set your mind on something, you're, you're putting all your focus and attention on it. This feast is to say, we've got to think about this. The reason people, we go back and eat the, the leaven, is we stop thinking. That's where the problem is. We stop focusing. If you lay out what your meal is going to be for every day of this week, and let's say I'm going to eat unleavened bread seven days, and there's the meal I'm eating. I'm thinking about it. That's what I'm going to eat that day. And then today as I get up, I'm going to have some of this. And you're thinking and focusing on eating unleavened bread, and that's the focus of the way you plan your menu. You're not going to fall into eating leavened bread. But what is it? We start getting into our normal routines again. We start going back into the way life has been, and all of a sudden you're eating a donut at work. Now, again, it's just a physical lesson that proves out something so obvious that we're going to fall right back into that carnal mind that is enmity with God. We're going to be right back to where we were before if we don't focus on Him. What is faith? What is faith? 
Is faith not a focus on God? Is faith not a belief that He exists and that He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him? Is it not putting your trust in His ways and His life? Is it not saying, I'm going to fix myself on you, God? That I need you. And God, you see my shortcomings and my weaknesses, and you say, God, I need you to, to live in me with your newness of life. Because, friends, we will never become this without God. We can try as, through the flesh as we might. We can't. We'll be a lot more successful in not eating physical leaven than we will not going back to sin of our own power. We have to set our minds on Jesus Christ. But will you commit to what he said as the holy, beloved, and elect of God? Will you look at this? I'm challenging you to read Colossians 3 every day this week. I'm asking you to put your mind on it, to focus on it. The things that you're saying, I'm putting out this leaven. I don't want it to be seen today in my life at all. Not in any of my dwelling place. And Father, fill me with your spirit that in everything, in word or deed that I do, that it's unto you. Fill me with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth in these things. Revivals are done when we realize how far we fall short, how much we need God to change us and transform us. This is His will for us. Think of what this church will be as we live in this more and more. Think of the work that God will be doing in our lives together when our focus is not on ourselves but on others, when we're looking out. You know, sometimes we get visitors in to the church here. And I, I saw visitors this week, and sometimes they just sit alone and nobody's looking out. We all have to look out for them. When somebody comes here new, it's your church. This is the fellowship where you live. Reach out to people. Serve them because they're God's children for whom Jesus died. Think about the mindset, the culture of love that God wants in His church. By this shall all men know you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Are you loving the people in this room? Are you making commitments for the people in this room in prayer, in fellowship, in service, in hospitality? Are you laying down your life as Christ did for us? Are you forgiving as Christ forgave? Are you looking to be thankful and appreciative for the people that are here? This is the place, the culture of the church is founded. It's right here. That's it. When someone comes into the body of believers, this is what they should see. That this is the spirit, this is the life that we have. And we settle for nothing less. We encourage one another, we pray for one another, and we help one another on this way. Jesus called us out to be freed from slavery, to walk in a new life. He's the Savior. He pulled us out so we wouldn't have to be subject to the things that create that bondage, that pain, that suffering, and those tears. He wants us to have this new life. Let's praise Him. Let's worship Him. Let's set our minds on Him now. Let's focus on God as we sing together and we worship Him in song. And as we sing together, let's just pour out our hearts and praise to Him. And God, Father, I just ask that You bless us, that we can praise You and that we can just sing to You with our whole hearts. Just put a new heart in us, God. Put a new heart in us, God, that we can focus on You and turn all of our attentions to You to worship You and serve You now. And God, I pray that you would just bless us with the Spirit that we could see each other as you see us. That we could see each other with the same vision that you have for us. And God, that we could imitate you in every way. That we could praise you. That we could worship you. And God, just put a new song in our hearts.